Yeah, thanks. We're going to just, uh, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit and what your team yeah. was able to work on here. and just... I grew up in Iceland. Where, and Iceland and Hawaii are sort of, you know, they, uh, they have a lot in common. It's also a volcanic island, a little bit, right. a bit colder. But we also have a lot of volcanoes that not from Iceland. Yeah, so, so that's uh, another thing we have in common. Was, the one I always have trouble with is 2014, and I'm always like, and I'm yeah, like, I have yeah, no well, idea how to... It's, <laughs> it's funny you bring up uh, that eruption, because actually that and the lowest region, so they're like brothers from brother from another mother, or whatever that, you say. That's literally what I was telling him right the entire time. I was like, so there's this one eruption in 2014 in Iceland, it's like, really similar. Yeah. Like, it was just under a, great, a glacier, the caldera. So, uh, <laughs> well, the caldera is under a glacier, yeah. yeah. But the eruption came up yeah, on, came the, up. on the rift zone. Right. Um, what was different, though, it was in the middle of nowhere. So right. The lava flows didn't impact anything. But the gas, all of Iceland, and 100 miles away, people found a group of bubble boots, five people down in a bubble bay. Wow. And, and uh, they have to air traffic. That as well. No, oh, that I well, that one? no, because it didn't. Oh, it didn't okay. make any ash. It, it was mm. just like a little easter. But it was 2010. Right. You thinking of also? Oh, that's all. So I can. This is my party trick. I can pronounce the name of any volcano in Iceland. Still working on the Hawaiian <laughs> ones, but yeah. So the the 2010 one is a Yafiatla Yukut, and the um, the first the the caldera. The uh, system is called Barva Bunka. There you go. And the eruption was called Holdering. There you okay. go. That's my party trick today. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. All right. So uh, we'll dive right into uh, the presentation that you uh, prepared for us today. Yeah. So as you see, there are quite a lot of names on that first. And this is because this is really a team. So I'm just here kind of, I'm lucky enough to have been able to come back to Hawaii a year later. But this is everything I'm going to present today. We'll talk about this absolutely. And actually, on the next slide, I'm going to introduce that unit. But um, essentially, our team that came over is from several universities, Leeds, Cambridge, and all. And we came here because HBO invited us um, probably around June last year, so a little bit after the eruption started. And we came out a couple of weeks later. But the last week, actually, that was an amazing day. Um, and the reason HBO would keep of us in particular, we specialize in something maybe a bit new, actually very important. And this is looking at um, all the really strange elements that come out of all. We all probably know that there are sulfur. And right. that's very important. Really aggressive to people. Yeah. Breathing and Respiratory, people with yeah. asthma and things like that are very sensitive. But there is other stuff, and I'm going to talk about that later. So much more that comes. That's actually quite tricky to measure and sample. And HBO, uh, because it can't be also it can't be done in real. So walking observers not have the right equipment or the manpower. But that's why HBO invited us, and they knew about our work from from Iceland. Team. And right. they'd seen kind of what we published, and they were like, that's really cool, and that's what we update. They reached out to us, and we want to play uh, like 200 pounds through it. Yeah, so. <laughs> you guys got here in late July? Yeah, mid, mid July, 16th mid -July, of July, okay. yeah. And so we were here until 5th of August, or well, 6th of August. The eruption sort of officially, I guess, got called off. Yeah. And that was the day we took down our equipment. And we're like, is this? Did, it, did we just pump all the gas out? <laughs> you guys are welcome. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> but it was very, very good timing for us uh, in terms of getting this day. Very good. All right. And we can have yeah. a little bit of your teammates here that came along. Everybody came along. and Well, yeah. So these are the people who came along. And of course, we had a backup of yeah. a lot of people right. from USGS here and back home from the racing work. So yeah, so you've, well, you've met me already. Um, Emily Mason is uh, my... The other half in this project, she's done. Uh, Rachel Wessey is also a student, um, specializes in what happens in the atmosphere after the stuff. Penny Wieser, she's also here in 2019. 
with rocks, but rocks less about what happens. And Emma, uh, she she's a volcanologist and she also flies. One of her main skills. So yeah, so we get sometimes asked, like, cool. why was it so old? And there's no reason other than just the right people. Just so happened that way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, well... Uh, That's, really this is why you were here. This right here, nice. these slides. Um, everybody remembers that was in the Lori's Rift Zone. Types of aid. No wind, it's uh, muggy, SO2 there, it just unbearable. A hazmat suit with all this equipment, it's like, yeah, that's about right. Like a ghost bus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't always bad, and I'm sure you will well, you'll be able to tell me more about that, but when it was bad, it was bad. Right. It was horrid. And this is near Isaac Halley, where we were taking samples of the ocean and space. And one of our team, he was a bit too hot, and he took off like half of the hazard suit, and he had whole so it was, it was nasty. Um, but the, the image on the right, or this is Mauna Kea, seen on a lower. And mm -hmm. you can see that cloud at the bottom of it. That's, that's volcanic. That haze. That's that haze. haze. So it was bad everywhere on my island, but probably in different ways. Yeah. Equipment. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Good question. We, well, we protect as much as we can. We wrap it up in several plastic pairs in a box and other plastic pairs. But yeah, it does corrode. So all, all up equipment essentially. Yeah. So we're just talking about the, like, the impact of the gas on you know uh, uh, your team members, you know, on your equipment, and of course this is why you're here to study what kind of pollution. So yeah. Um, what else can you tell us? Um, well, so actually, if you if you um, press uh, get the next thing up, yeah. So this is uh, my friend Paddy the particle. Um, he he will ask several questions, kind of prompt me what to say. But this was essentially our our main like thing that we wanted to find out when we were here. Is we know there is stuff coming out of the volcano that's causing bad air quality near the vent. We know there's also bad air quality far away from the volcano. But what does is there any change? Like and what is the change? So that's that's kind of our main question that we're trying to, to answer. Uh, okay. Who remembers the periodic table? Hands up. Uh, <laughs> <Hey. yeah. laughs> so I'm going to quiz you on this at the end yeah, of the talk. There will be a quiz later on track. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, well, the point here is that volcanoes, so I, I call them like recycling stations of the Earth, mm -hmm. because almost every element that you see on the periodic table, as we know it, comes out of volcanoes in some quantity. But also volcanoes are individuals. So, and a volcano, as, as individuals do, that it can change throughout its lifetime. So sometimes volcanoes emit more of the certain elements, sometimes less, and that's what we're also trying to understand why that happens. But um, some of these elements are more harmful than others. So if you uh, press next, sulfur. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so we know sulfur irritates us, and, and, uh, and actually sulfur is quite well understood in health studies. We know how much sulfur will have negative health impacts. Right. And there are, there are studies where they've literally like, exposed volunteers to certain concentrations to see when they would start coughing and reacting. Um, so kind of what we call acute exposure, so short-term exposure to high concentrations, we know at which point you will start coughing and you will start coughing or as asthmatic person will start coughing. Um, what is not as well understood is what happens if you live close to a a power plant that produces SO2 or a volcano, and you're exposed to kind of not as high concentrations right, that will make you like, uh, but, but for very long periods. We don't, we, mm -hmm. there are some, but yeah, you just need to do a very long term study on people, and it's just, it's just hard right. to make them very good. But this is kind of the sort of the approximate concentration that we believe, we be, well, health experts believe are, are harmful. Uh, hydrogen sulfide is another form of sulfur. It tends right. to be the lower temperature form, so it comes up more after eruptions when it's not kind of magma isn't there anymore to heat it up. It also comes from actually biogenic activity. So there are bacteria that that sort of excuse my language, but like farted out. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so actually, often near geothermal areas, hydrogen sulfide is mostly biogenic. There's a there are variations there, but uh, okay. it's a mixture basically. 
And this point one uh, point zero two five ppm is that uh, reading that was taken in. Oh, sorry, I should have clarified yeah. that. No, this is the guideline. This, this is, is what guideline. what what okay. um, uh, I believe this is this is a U.S. guideline. I don't remember right. if it's from EPA or Department of Health. I took it from a website called International Volcanic Health Hazard Network. Uh, we can write that down somewhere if people are interested. But they refer to their original source. So, um, but. We all know about sulfur being bad, right? but as I mentioned in the beginning, there is loads of other stuff as well, and what we call metals. So people will have, I'm sure will have heard of things like lead, yeah, cadmium, right, right. nickel, copper, zinc, um, arsenic, you know, all of these kind of probably people associate with pollution, right? Right, commonly associated, yeah, yes. Yeah. And the ones that have boxes around them on this slide is what EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, has identified in their like official reports as ones to keep an eye on. They call them environmentally important. What that means, they have they have right. a they can they can put, they can have negative impacts on the environment and health in large enough quantities. And that was the focus of your team's uh, yeah. activities here. Yeah. So that's the, the thing. We want to go beyond, beyond sulfur right. because sulfur was already monitored by other people. So if, if you press next for me, sorry, uh, sorry about this, this slightly distressing slide, but I think it's really important to highlight this actually, is that some of these chemicals, they are good for us in small quantities. And in fact, like fluoride is added to our toothpaste right. and selenium is added to our shampoo and hair conditioners. Uh, and iron, you need it, you know, for your blood right. to be healthy. But if you cross that good threshold and, and have too much of them, then they start to become negative. It, um, so this this photograph is taken um, on a Pacific island of Vanuatu, where there's also an active volcano. It's very different from Kilauea in the sense they produce a lot of fluorine. We're lucky here in Hawaii that that's not that's not a problem. But it gets into the groundwater, and people, if they consume it, and especially when they're young, this will this will cause their teeth to rot. So while fluorine is added to our toothpaste because we don't have naturally enough of it. If you drink too much of it or eat too much food or possibly even inhale too much of it, you will actually do it to right. full rot. So it's kind of like mm -hmm. almost goes the other way, doesn't it? So it's all the health studies, they have to kind of find that Goldilocks you know, zone, right? zone, right? So where it's just good, but then you cross the threshold and it um, becomes bad for you. Yeah, so and then yeah, this is why it's so tricky. So for the metals, we don't have as good guidelines on how right. much is healthy and how much is unhealthy. Um, I, there are some guidelines, for example, from, uh, yeah, you can find them on, on the EPA website, for instance. Oh, would those guidelines be for artificially produced uh, metals? So, or yeah, you, yeah, this is the thing. So mostly they are set in to protect workers exactly. in things like metal smelters. Yeah. Where, and they're all set, like, this is how much lead or whatever you can be exposed to over eight hours in a working week. And then you go home, it's assumed, in a clean environment. Right. And of course, people who work in metal smelters tend to be healthy adults, right? They're, you know, well, right. at least they should be. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Um, but however, they they will be very different to a small child with asthma. So mm. guidelines. Uh, the bottom line is that we're all different, and what's healthy for me might not be healthy for somebody who's who's on, you know, has right. a pre-existing condition. So all of the studies that do exist are very compartmentalized in how they actually yeah. what they are talking about. And it's and easier to measure when the exposure is short and okay. high versus when you're exposed to multiple things oh. at the same time at lower yeah. levels, but over very long periods. So what I can't tell you in my today is whether the concentrations we saw last year are going to cause any health problems. Just the science isn't there yet. What we can do is provide the information to say, look, this is what we found. This is what people were exposed to all right. last year. And we think we can go further back to 1983 when Kilea became really active and say all the 35 year periods, this is what people have been exposed to. And then hopefully uh, health experts, which I'm not, can go and, 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 and analyze what, what are the associated health impacts because now they know what the people have been exposed to. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And let's talk about some of these concentrations of these things. Yeah. That's where it gets absolutely crazy is when you start looking at how much of this stuff was actually released. So you've set up some points of comparison for uh, here. We have Kilauea, 2018, 2008, Lava Lake, 
uh, Mount Edna in 2001 eruption, and then the entire production of the U.S., the U.K., and China, like as cumulative holes of the country's, you know, production. So you can see here, uh, Kilauea during 2018, uh, if you want to take no, it away. Yeah, right? I, I showed this to you yesterday. Yeah, like, Whoa! This was the, yeah. the, the one that really got yeah. to me. It was like, wait, 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 wait. We have to start looking to the whole of China to find a point of comparison, or the whole of the U.S., or like stuff like that. It's, the scale is huge. Absolutely. Like, what What do you have after China to compare to? What's yeah. the next thing? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> the whole planet. Or yeah. Something. yeah, yeah, and um, uh, actually, we're still revising how much was coming out of Kilauea because we're still getting um, improved data on the SO two flux, and this mm. is how we know how much of the metals came out. So, if the SO two flux goes up, the metal emissions will also go up so we might have to go to the whole planet to <laughs> get a comparison maybe not but we were absolutely floored by this as well we do have a question i think it's a little outside your expertise uh, sure. but ask it anyways it seems that like the health experts should be monitoring the folks in the area during the eruption for any future health problems related to the eruption he plans on doing that yeah right. um so Absolutely. I would love to see that done Right. in, in Hawaii and other countries that suffer from the same problem. Uh, so w I've had very um, a lot of interest from the Department of Health in our, in our data. Um, so we are we're now good. kind of, yeah, exactly, yeah. I, they're very keen. It's uh, There's absolutely no lack of interest from that side. So we've also applied for funding to just uh, get health experts, you know, uh, mm. basically in, being able to employ health experts to do this Work on staff because you have you. to be an expert right. in doing this yeah so we're, we're just waiting to hear about funding and and then we can start doing the first steps at least and uh uh and hopefully yeah in some years time there will be definitive answers on that right so we can see all these different elements uh just how they the, the amount that was released by 2018 kilaway is just incredible across the board uh yeah, I guess I just want to say that um, these metals then go up in the air and they transport it with the prevailing wind direction in what we call volcanic plume. So if you hear me talking about plume, that's what I mean. It's sort of the cloud that drifts away from the volcano. And this is kind yeah, of how it... Well, this is what, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> this is kind of was uh, the model that it was really kind of all we had for a while during the eruption. And the thing about it was is uh, conditions on the ground often didn't match what the model was showing. Like, you'd be like, oh, the model shows this. You go into the call and like, okay, we're not going. Uh, no, that's not, that's not yeah. what's happening right now. It's, it's, it's the beginning stages. It's where it needs to go. But it's like, okay, this isn't there yet. This mm -hmm. is just iteration one like, yeah. of this type of technology. Yeah, it's so hard to make models agree exactly what's on the ground. Right. Because, A, we don't know exactly how much is coming out of the volcano, right? Um, the volcano creates its own weather, like the eruption, you probably, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, and that's not something that like, just the typical, well, you have to like, write the code to be able to account for that. And that's not straightforward because things will change all the time. So you have all these factors feeding into each other. Right. Um, so work is ongoing for sure. I think it's probably better to have something than nothing, you know, at least Absolutely. qualitatively. Right. But yeah, it's so hard. I, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm not a modeler, basically. Yeah, it's, no, it was, it's just, it's incredibly hard. The amount of asterisks that would have had been attached to it, it's like, okay, well, you know, asterisks for wind speeds, because we're not too sure about how they're exactly interacting at all these different points. Mm -hmm. the asterisks for changes mm -hmm. in the plume. Asterisks is for weather patterns. It's just like, oh, it just gets, you know, ugly quick. So it was good to have. And yeah. it'd be great to see what the next iterations of Absolutely. that type of tech is. And uh, um, however I, it needs to be done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what I guess what I want to show here is at least for sulfur, it was available. Right. Something, at least, you know, first approximation. And also you had the air quality stations from Department of Health, uh, at least, uh, yeah, in some places. So what, I, what I'm trying to say here is that sulfur, we can measure in real time and we can forecast it. But if you uh, press the next button, then um, basically for the metals, those like, things that we, A, don't know what, how much is healthy, and we also don't have any way of measuring them in real time. Right. And we then therefore people know extremely little about what, how far do they go? Do they go as far as sulfur? Do they follow the same path? Does it do they deposit? The, uh, yeah, real especially. Quickly. Yeah, and this is what we were trying to. I mean, we wouldn't be able to answer maybe everything at one go, but this is this is the area we were trying to contribute to better understanding of. Uh, yeah, I was going to, just going to show where we were able to set up stations. So we set up as many stations as we could 
we had manpower and equipment. So starting from the west coast, we had station in, in sort of in Kona area, uh, Ocean in Pahala. These three stations were co-located with Department of Health air quality stations. And then there was a station in Volcano Village, up on Mauna Loa Observatory, and closer to the eruption site, we had a station in Orchidland where we were staying, in Pahoa and in Leilani. In Leilani, uh, if you want to know exactly where it was, it was on um, Alapai Streets, where there was a Viper air quality station. So mm. uh, we co-located there as well. Yeah, um, I so guess, yeah. Go anything ahead. interesting that you notice at, like, say, Orchid, uh, orchid Land? Because that should be out of the majority of the plume. Yeah. Like, with the wind directions yeah. and how it was operating. But was there still anything that was picked up at that? Uh, uh, I think Orchid Land was our, is probably as close to Hawaiian background as okay. it gets. Yeah. It was yeah. acting as a background at that point. Well, uh, that's what we see, yeah. So okay. I think, actually, I have the next slide is probably showing that exactly. Oh, no. Well, this is what we did. Um, we can, well... I guess what I want to show is that there should be a time lapse of us working in the lab, but oh. uh, it's okay. Uh, but it was an incredible amount of work, and we came home with like 400 samples, which is 10 times more than we've ever collected on a volcano before, because we were working like all around the island and over three weeks. Uh, so it was it was right. a the big access, campaign for us. The access to everything, too. Like, it's not in the middle of nowhere. I mean, yeah. yeah it's, oh, this was like can, everything came together. Uh, right, yeah. You can actually get to things to actually pull Absolutely. samples. Absolutely, yeah. And it took six months to do the lab work on this. So this is why we can't give results in real time. And I understand it's frustrating, and it's frustrating for us as well. We would love to be here during the eruption and say, hey, this is what's happening. We just, we're just not there yet. Right. Um, well, it sounds like you guys, you guys are able to use this little window that you, uh, you're correlating it to the sulfur flux, mm -hmm. and therefore you're making some inference about other times and absolutely. getting to that point where you actually may be able to, yeah. and you're really looking at this variation. So it's really uh, absolutely fascinating and really important work. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess this is the first yeah results. So remember, we were here during the last three weeks of the eruption. Right. So we this does not necessarily show what the conditions were like in the beginning if you know when there were more fissures or um maybe slightly different like a reversal of trade winds or things like that when we were there there were trade wind conditions you know and the business as usual for hawaii um in the in the weather department so okay so the different colors from left to right if it's difficult to see colors i'm going to read them out in order so Leilani is the uh, kind of red bar that you can barely see on some of the some of the elements. Then it's Orchidland, which is also very very small, barely visible. Mm -hmm. uh, then Volcano Village, it's quite high. Then Pahala, Ocean View, and Kona. So at that point, we were acting as if uh, Orchidland is our background. We can just as an assumption, and we can see how. Yeah, all the other places that were more downwind, or even at long distances where Pahala, Kona, yeah, those are what, 70 miles away, something like something that. Something like that, yeah. yeah. And well, Kona is probably more like 100 miles yeah, as the plume travels more, because right. it goes out to sea and then comes back. Yeah, but you can see all of the elements. I'm just selecting a few. We, we analyzed something like 60 different elements. Uh, so they, they all pretty much follow the same pattern where volcano, when the plume is headed that way, has the highest concentrations. Did you, when you said the, the Leilani station, was it on North Alapai or South? South. So yeah. it should have been pretty close to where the plume actually was, you yeah. think. Um, yeah. For, so the local residents, they tell me it did come in like offs, but um, averaged out, it was uh, pretty close to background. So yeah. Um, it does not mean that there weren't any episodes when it would have been uh, a bit nasty. Yeah, very so, much so. Yeah. This is all sourced from the actual Lower East Rift Zone and Fisher Line, right? And we're not yeah. talking about any summit emissions coming through that, just well, to kind of clarify. The, I mean, there were probably some coming out from the summit, mm -hmm. but yeah, they, I, I, don't, I can't remember the number for the summit of uh, emissions at the time, maybe 100 tons a day yeah, is there now. Right. So right. that's thousands of times less than Fisher 8 was pouring out right. or the so, lava flows. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, I, think I, so. I think it would just been lost, you know, in the you know, it's such a tiny amount that's zero point one percent. Right, 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 absolutely. Yeah. And it might, might, might have been slightly different at the very first few days of collapse, but by, by July that was mm -hmm. probably not that was. We also case. in some of the stations we see uh, what we think is the ash from the summit because of course mm -hmm. there were periodic explosions, and then that ash would have been uh, picked up by the wind, resuspended. So we see certain elements that we know are found in ash. And mm -hmm. we see some days are more polluted, and we see that particular volcano Pahala and sometimes right. Ocean View that were uh, receiving the, the ash. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that kind of is it possible some of that could have been remobilized from those earlier deposits as well? Absolutely. I think so. when we were there, the explosions were kind of winding down. Right. Um, but that's we know continues to be picked up. In the park for one of them? No, no, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That was one thing I wanted to do. I was like, I want to be up there for one of these things. Come on. Like, I hear the stories yeah. about the guys up there. And I'm like, come on. Look. No. We never went into the park, actually. So the action was here. That's fascinating. If you look at the plot, the volcano had so much impact of, the, of these uh, metallic components of the, of the plume. Yeah. Um, to go along with all of the actual ground shaking that was happening there. We often think that the Lower East Rift had you know, maybe the most gas impacts. That may be true for SO2 and H2S, but it's really mm-hmm. interesting to pointing out how the how that kind of middle zone, right? There's like a magic distance where these peaks, so the green boxes seem to have the highest peaks. Yeah. And as far as it travels, it's still you still have a different distribution that's higher than like actually closer to the source. But really peaks around that green or kind of a hollow region, that's great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um I was just looking the point to make sure the volcano when you're talking about volcano, you're actually talking about the summit itself, not volcano. No, village. sorry, volcano it village, is, it is volcano village, village. Okay. yeah, 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 yeah. That's so it's a volcano art center to be precise because there's an SO two analyzer there that okay, the art um university or the Department of Health no Department of Health, sorry, um a researcher uh, has put up there. It's been there since two thousand and eight. Uh, you can see the data online. So it made sense for us to co locate it's really interesting that that was where most of these uh, elements were deposited instead of... There was a lot of variation, variation. So what, because Volcano didn't receive the plume as consistently mm-hmm. as Kona and Oshu, where it's kind of, that's just, it's just how it circulates. Volcano was more dependent on short-term fluctuations in the wind fields. Same as Lilani, I would imagine, because sometimes the wind would probably bring stuff down, right. and sometimes it wouldn't, and there would be a huge difference in air quality between those, those times. Yeah, there'd be days where it was absolutely fine, and then you'd be back in the same spot the next day, and you you, you couldn't even get close. Yeah. Not happening. Yeah. To put it in a little bit of context, like, okay, we know there was stuff coming into the populated areas, but how bad was it? Um, so right. what I've done there is I've pulled data from a, uh, it's a, a it's an American project called Improve, as you can bottom the right there. So, and they, they have stations sort of, on mainland US. There is actually one uh, in Volcano Village. Um, oh wow, one of Yeah, it's been there for works. several years. Oh, wow. They they are <laughs> they don't put up data in real time at all. So 2004 and 2005 is the newest data that I, is online. Mm. So mm-hmm. we think we're slow with one year. But, you know, yeah. And in some cases, it, it, it's, yeah, it's, uh, you can't get these results in real time at all. But, you know, uh, cities, um, we, we can still, it's still a valid comparison, even though some, some things are becoming cleaner. Uh, so, yeah, so the kind of the black, dark gray, light gray bars are cities on mainland US. So Los Angeles, Houston, Chicago, New York. And the colored one, the green one, is Pahala, light blue, Ocean View, and then Kona, dark blue. Uh, so you can see that, um, for instance, like selenium at the top, uh, the stations or the, the, the communities in um, on Hawaii are exceeding the, those big cities. Right. And That's it's, incredible. yeah, and it's quite variable for some, you know, it's kind of within that range. So concentrations here in Hawaii, similar to very large cities. Um, now, we don't know yet what it will be like now that the emissions are low, but that's what we're doing this year. We're collecting the same samples in the same locations. Right. To see, like, hopefully those bars for Hawaii will go right down. So hopefully, like, in a year, you'll have that data able to show, like, okay, after the eruption, during the pause, yeah. like, this is what the, the all these, uh, all the concentrations went down to. Yeah. And that'd be huge to be able to, for next time. Too. Absolutely. And we think we can get the results up quicker than a year, because now we have the methodology, and we kind of know what we're looking for. Right, become more proficient at it. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah, uh, this is an important result. So the, the the plot is a little bit complicated, but I'll, I'll try to explain it. So all the like, uh, so on the on the bottom there are um, from left to right these are all the trace elements. There's things like silver, uh, selenium, cadmium, arsenic, all the nasty stuff basically, and all the wiggly lines going up and down. There are different volcanoes around the world. So you see some volcanoes are higher than others for certain elements. So basically all I wanted to see is this variation there. And um, the ones that are colored blue and that generally on top, it says they're arc volcanic plumes. These are subduction zone volcanoes. So like you will find on the west coast, 
of the United States or South America or Ring of Fire of the Pacific. Um, and they tend to have um, higher emissions than volcanoes from what we call hotspots, so like Kilauea. Um, what were you yeah. saying uh, yesterday about uh, Kilauea in 2018, the, lot of the, signal, the concentrations that you were observing? Mm-hmm. And the 2008 observations yeah. are eerily similar, if not the same, almost. Yeah, so if you look there closely, the, the yellow ones, uh, so there's yellow triangles, uh, that's Kilo 2008, mm-hmm. yeah. And the yellow squares are right Kilo 2018. And can you see how they follow each other really closely, those two lines? Right. So, okay, there's a little bit of difference there for the one on the far right. The, the, the next one, copper, is... You know, almost identical, almost identical, almost identical. Within the margins of errors. Yeah, all exactly. Them, basically all so uh, what this means is that Kilauea, there's no difference between 2008, even though that was up in the summit, so it was a lava lake, completely different activity. Duke 2018, when the magma traveled 20 miles, I think, underground. Yeah. So why is this important? I mean, scientifically, it's hugely interesting, but why is it important? It, because it means that Kilauea is consistent within itself. And that means when next eruption happens, we can make an educated guess that the emissions and the, the kind of the air pollution are going to have the same composition. And it'll be interesting to see since, you know, last time Mauna Loa erupted was in 83, and I would highly doubt that any of this data that would exist no, for that. It doesn't. I don't make, think so. I don't think so seen it, yeah. So when Mauna Loa finally does go again, it'd be really interesting then to compare it to Kilauea. Yeah. And see, like, okay, what, is, the, what does it look like with the... Uh, yeah. The gas emissions. That's fascinating, yeah, because, uh, you know, in the future, you can imagine that you know, a, health, a health researcher could take this and make a particular, um, I suppose, a triage plan for each volcanic community based on the profile of gases coming up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And also, it's, we have to work with the modelists, so the ones who can tell us where the plume is going. Mm-hmm. Because now that we know the composition of it, and they can tell us like how is it going to travel according if the wind direction changes and things like that. So we have to work with our community very closely as well. And that's what we are hoping that's to do. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So you guys, and then, you know, measuring the actual the actual gases, mm-hmm. the modelers, and then the health professionals, and then the impact yeah. further on. Yeah. Yeah. And then you know uh, whoever has the, the sort of the yeah whoever is then responsible for making response planning. Actually, telling uh, people. Yeah. Them. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we can uh, hop into the... You have a video to show as well, if you want to. Uh, if you think that's the right time. Oh, I don't yeah. know. I actually don't um, know what's on the... the uh, like, so, the well, um, yeah. So there's a volcano in, in Nicaragua, in Central America, right. that where people have also to have to live with this problem. With They mm-hmm. live really close to the volcano, less than a mile, closest houses. And this volcano is always degassing. Um, it's been doing it, well, for... It, like it's active for a decade and takes a short break and has been doing this as long as historical records go back so 500 years probably longer uh, and we've been working out there we've been just asking the communities like what is it like for you to live there and hoping that we can um, well learn something and uh, maybe get a discussion going between different countries that experience the same problems and what they can learn from each other yeah so it's a it's a 10 minute documentary um, I'll leave it up to you guys to see if you want to play all of it, or we can play the first minutes, for example, sort of an intro. But it's also available on YouTube. It's called Living with Volcanic Gases. And mm-hmm. if people are interested to see see it again or see more of it, then they can look it up. Now let's check it out. Is the sound going to work? Yeah, I just have okay. to. Yo vine aquí de, de 25 años. Aquí compramos este lugar que nacía de ayer volcán. Estamos en la comunidad Panamá Los Amadores. Una comunidad que es bastante afectada por los gases volcánicos. Tengo que vivir aquí 17 años. De los 16 años pueden tener experiencias de cómo el volcán hace, nos afecta, qué, cuál es el cuidado que tenemos que tener. 
cuál es lo que tenemos que hacer, ¿verdad? En nuestros tiempos de lluvia, que sabemos que cuando más se alborota el humo. Y aquí me quedé porque lo llevo a ley. Sí, exactly. Cuando, cuando yo me senté había palo. Porque el cerro un tiempo ya se había, ya se había apagado. You know, this guy breathing. No, that's como diez tallos que yo, such a COPD. Yo cerrado y todo, todo. Arroz, frijoles, trigo, maíz, todo sembrado. Nunca dejé de ser agricultor. Yeah, so this Cuando area is tropical forest. Right. Oh wow, this was all tropical forest. Yeah, you know. It's even further south than Hawaii, so it's a uh, rainforest. I can pause it or mute it and let you talk over it. No, I think, oh, I don't know, whatever. I think they kind of say the same things. So. una comunidad habitada por bastante niños. Hay niños que tienen, que parecen de asma, ese humo se les introduce en los pulmoncitos, como que les da más afectación, que los pone demasiado cansados. Yo sé cuando está el gas, porque aquí ya la garganta ya la siento reseca, ya la nariz ya la ando mal, entonces yo le digo a él, hay gas volcánico, niño. Y cuando él le empieza, pues porque ya él le duele la garganta y él ya siente que ya o sea, se empieza a cansar. Tuve que aprender a, a tratarlo a él como es su medicamento, su tratamiento. Cuando está en los gases volcánicos, me dice el médico de que no salga al aire libre, que esté solo adentro. Estos problemas, ¿verdad?, del volcán, pues. Hay que saberlos como saberlos un poquito manejar. Algo que no lo afecta. Porque con eso, yeah. porque con el zinc, que lo que es el aluminio, la lata, es lo más un A. All right, so. It's really interesting how uh, it's it's going. It's, going. Okay. Uh, it's really interesting to me just how the the effects of you know these people and the, you were saying that this was a whole vegetated area and now it's been reduced down to just grass level almost of uh, the vegetation. Um, yeah, exactly. But it's interesting for me also to hear if um, how similar those uh, impacts that they are describing in a different country, but it's not like when I came over this morning, I borrowed your scissors, you were like, oh, this all like rusts. And I was like, oh, I've heard this one before. Like, uh, yeah, and I asked you if it was, rust, yeah. it was, of course it's the tropics, so things will rust anyway, but you were saying it was worse during the eruption. Right. Yeah. It, was, it was, it was like the salt water mist you get down in the ocean type of levels of rust you would get mm -hmm. or more. And when you, you were directly exposed to one of those gas vents, Like, I remember my dad's had a gate, a uh, galvanized seal, that had very little to no rust on it before the eruption. And a fisherman opened up right beside it. Didn't take it, but just spent it on it for, like, a week straight. It was one of the primary volcanic, you know, volcanic vents at that point. It was at Fisher uh, 3. 
And it, I saw a picture of it later, and it was screwed, just as brown as brown gets. It just had rusted all through, and it was just gone, and that was in a week. Like, okay, so there's some, you know, it, acid rain is like rain, whereas the, the, the plume itself is like a sandblaster. Like yeah. It just turns everything to rust that it touches. It's incredible. So uh, the thing that's in, so it's not even... So it's not just the rain that makes things rust. So you, sometimes you don't even have any rain; things still rust. It's because the acid gases they well they turn they acid themselves, but also turn into just tiny droplets, like sulfuric acid droplets, and they that's the thing that was just so so corrosive. And this was you know during the eruption. This was early on, probably about May 20th or something along those lines, uh, maybe a little later, 24th, 25th, somewhere in there. But you can see the massive amount of gas just being emitted here and how each plume kind of goes different. Like the, one of the plumes looks like it's uh, sticking near the ground. The other one's going straight mm -hmm. up in the air. Uh, so this is why we mentioned earlier how difficult it is to model this. Like, yeah, you just you need a, yeah incredibly sophisticated model to, you know, pick up all, predict all of that. It's just... Right. And all uh, the different yeah. distribution points for the gas. Like, yes, you have all these separate fissures, but every old fissure is still venting. And you right. can see that here where all of these previous fissures are still venting. Yes, there's a little lava activity at some of them too, you can see. Exactly. But this this gas was the constant of the eruption of the eruption where we, there was always heavy gas. It was sometimes more heavy than others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You feel it more than others, sometimes more than others. But the one thing I was seeing is the vents don't really, they don't uh, shut off and move or anything yeah. like that at that point. It's just, yeah, they just, it's still venting gas. Like it's, Do you think it was uh, raining more when the plume was going? Oh, 100%. It was raining feet a day in Leilani because of that localized weather system that anchored over it and mm -hmm. uh, localized lightning storms. And mm -hmm. even for like the month after, two months after the eruption, it was really strange weather to me. Like I, 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 I did was told by some meteorologists, professional meteorologists that, uh, yeah, they shouldn't be able to affect the, the weather patterns anymore. And more of the citizen scientist style, like Harry Durgan, yeah. uh, guys that work with us are like, Oh no, that's definitely still happening. Um, it's it's right. definitely still playing with little things. Uh, this is actually something we were predicting by looking at our data, so it's really nice for me to hear this now. Um, and I'm hoping to get some real time, also real rain gauge measurements, which I understand people are collecting, like citizen science stuff. Right. Um, but what we were seeing, maybe if we can go back to one of the slides, I can show another figure. Um, is that actually those like nasty trace elements? So, sorry, oh, or take or yeah, drivable. Oh, this is a nice photograph actually by Harry. Yeah, he very kindly gave it to me. I saw I saw his photographs on I uh, I think the present like it was an actual trailer presentation they did, mm -hmm. and I emailed him and I was like, wow, you know, some of these photographs are showing exactly what I'm measuring, but I don't have such a good visual representation. Um, so what we're seeing here, and I, I was absolutely you know wanted this photograph was that we can see stuff falling out of the plume really quite close to the vent. Right. So you can see it kind of just raining out, even though it's maybe not necessarily even rain. It could be sometimes, it could be, yeah. but it could also just be this tiny particles dropping, right. dropping out. And what we were interested in finding out is whether uh, all of the particles drop out at the same time or whether sort of certain metals, like right. does lead fall out sooner than copper? Right. Because that then has implications for environmental impacts. It has yeah. And if you can start yeah, establishing those types of trends where, like, yes, one of these travels much further than the other, that's huge. Right? You, you just set me up very nicely, actually. So, uh, okay, so here are our measurement stations. So Fisher 8 is at the far left, and then going to Volcano Village, Pahala, Ocean Yukona, and you can see sort of approximate distance from Fisher 8. Yeah? So um, on the, on the um, kind of vertical... Uh, scale is how much percentage of the concentration of fish rate remains in those locations. So at fish rate, everything is at 100%, and then you decrease everything going away. Right. Let me know if you want any kind of more detailed explanations. So the different colors uh, kind of show that different elements are depleted at, 
at different rates. So um, the the one I've coloured blue, you know, at the top. By the time you get to volcano, it has been reduced on average by about fifty percent. The, then they have sort of the yellow amber group, and that's the one below, and that's depleted by a much more above fifty percent, up to ninety five percent. Just by the time you reach volcanoes, which is our first station, and then the red group is depleted extremely fast by over over ninety five percent is is gone somewhere by right. the time you reach this volcano. So within the the twenty miles or so, it's most of it's gone by it's, then. It's all fallen out, or not all, but most ninety five percent. Yeah, five yeah. percent remaining. So actually, between volcano and Kona, there's negligible fallout as right. such, or because it's all gone already. Sure. So it's, it's like the first hour of the plume's life; it loses a lot of it. And what we think is happening is that um, that that rain is is cleaning out the, the plume, and that, that rain is actually the water in the plume condensing. Mm-hmm. You, you, I mean, of course, you can have just normal meteorological rain, but the, the plume itself can also rain out. So. You, that would just can, yeah. add to the, the acid rain effect. It's not just sulfur in the, in in the that rain. rain yeah. It's a whole bunch of hard, min- uh, hard uh, metals, and yeah, it's just setting up for the extra what rust that we saw during the Yeah, or oh, potentially accumulation in catchment water. Mm. And that's why I was asking about that. Should yeah, sample your tank? Yeah, it, <laughs> like, really how many drained it since the Russian? Not no, fully, no. no. <laughs> uh, but it, it, must, it must go somewhere. That's, right. that's, the, that's the thing we know for sure. So if it is really raining out, it, it could be that we, we need to think about um, how people use catchment water during eruptions. I think it's absolutely fine to wash and, and things like that, but uh, for drinking it, maybe it needs extra filtration or at least some checks on what's in it. Yeah, the main thing um, for me with the water was that what it did to the plumbing, like inside the house, the corrosion, the, what it did to the water pump, stuff like that. It just, well, hot water heaters, a uh, bunch of people have replaced those types of things. Okay. And well, those are really the big ones, but then uh, you're just hoping, like, okay, I hope you guys are, you, we're using CPDC and not uh, mm-hmm. copper. And mm-hmm. a lot of these pipes and stuff like that. And yeah. you just little things now matter. Um, getting exposed to the, the, the air and the water from this eruption. Yeah, and you can ingest a lot more by drinking it, or at least for some of them. Um, however, this this kind of cleansing, self cleansing of the plume is what we started sort of calling it between ourselves, because you know the, the particles actually promote the rain forming, mm-hmm. and then the rain falls out. So the the plume is sort of self cleaning. Mm-hmm. It means that at least for the areas further away, it means that less nasty stuff reaches them. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think I, I might have a. Uh, Are we talking yeah, about actual um, like uh, stuff getting getting dissolved, like as a solid one water, or is it actually physically getting flushed out by the rain, catching it and pulling it down? Yeah. So uh, this is the thing. So um, actually, if we look at yeah, it's a very good question. It's something we have looked at. Uh, I've highlighted. I've shown which like elements you find in each of those blue, amber, and red groups, and the ones that have the box around them are the ones we know to be environmentally important or have potential impact. So actually, the ones that fall out the quickest, the red one has proportionally well has most of those uh, environmentally important elements. So if I can find the right slide, I can show you how what the solubility of uh, this is something for us to think about later. Um, essentially. What we know is that those red and amber groups, they are highly soluble. So this is what happens when you put it in water or weak acid like you find in natural environments because rainwater, for example, even it's clean, it's still below pH 7, it's like 5.56. So yeah, so if you put those red group elements in water, they just 95% dissolve instantaneously. Uh, The amber group, which remember, also depleted quite fast. Not as fast. That's almost also very soluble. However, that blue group is significantly less soluble, and that's because the well, I don't know if I need to go into this here. Maybe maybe people are interested, but uh, they they have a different composition. They're essentially tiny fragments of magma thrown up in the air when you have the bubble bursting. And of course, everyone intuitively can probably understand that if you put a tiny fragment of magma in a glass of water. It's not going to dissolve, at least right. not very fast. It will dissolve eventually, right. <laughs> especially right. with all the acid rain. It does dissolve, and that's why it's not 0% soluble, it's 50% soluble. Yeah. But Things but like, like Pele's hair, if you already see it. Yeah, exactly, or even tinier, tinier. Yeah, like, it's hard to imagine that, yeah, actually, eruptions like this do produce 
ash. Like, it, right, yeah. it's just, you can't see it as easily. It's not like right. spectacular column like Mountain Helens right. or something like that. But it does, you know, because you can see um, on that, well, it is a gift, but it doesn't work. But uh, you have this, you know, f- this kind of fountaining in the in, in the vent, and um, and that's what, you know, makes bubbles burst and just uh, dust of magma coming up. Um, while, while the others, the red and the amber groups, they actually form, they're more like sea spray, they're, they're salts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's why they're very water soluble. And that's why we think they can get uh, washed out, like dissolved into rain droplets and settle out very easily. And this is important also because stuff that's more easily soluble can also be absorbed by living things much easier. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually, absolute concentration doesn't mean that much. It's more like environmentally. If, you know, uh, available, that's what we call it, how easily soluble it is in, in for plants to take up and, and people if we drink it or whatever. Um, right. yeah. So that's another important finding, I would say, is that yeah, it some of these things, like when they come out of volcanoes, are extremely environmentally reactive because they're so water-soluble. Yeah, so that seems to fall, and so kind of, to kind of re- you know, repackage what you just said a little, a little bit less intelligently, like they kind of mm-hmm. uh, follow the same pattern as your, as your graph. Right, so you can say mostly it's it's getting dissolved by the water, seems likely. Yeah. Oh, probably there's some other effect as well. Well, and that's what we're trying to kind of work through the mathematics of, but that's what we believe is happening. And it was so nice, well, interesting to hear about all the rain under the moon because that's mm-hmm. what I was hoping to hear. Oh, it was yeah, insane yeah. rain. Like, so uh, that's exactly kind of confirms my hypothesis. I mean, yeah, often within like a mile, you know, you're, 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 we'd be sitting at the hub at outside of Ola and we or just a. Uh, Beaches down the road, and between there was a wall right. where it would rain, you know, maybe less than an inch and 13 inches yep. across that line. I mean, even after the eruption, I had my catchment unhooked from the gutters for months, like from the eruption start till like the end, and then even afterwards for months, I just didn't hook it back up. We drained it, half of it filled it back up with, you know, hooked it up, drained, filled it up, then unhooked it again. And it rained so much that I had like two people living here. And I didn't have that thing hooked up the entire time. And I was finally like, you know, I'm probably going to get low on water. I should go check it because it's not hooked up and it's covered. Through the cover, it had rained enough to keep the tank full and overflowing. I was like, okay, it's, it's just, it's just it's, there's way too much rain. Like, I don't even got to worry about this. Yeah. <laughs> even with the thing unhooked, it's too much rain. Like, that's insane. Um, when the eruption was in Iceland five years ago, the one we mentioned in the beginning, so it was a very similar eruption to the 2018. Um, but then, because Iceland is much colder, it was not raining, it was hailing. And we were like, it was the blue skies everywhere else except under the plume. And we were like having to wear like hard hats just like, because it was big hail. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> That's the most kind of hazard you don't think of as being hailed to death. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that was fascinating. So yeah. does the hail absorb? Is it is probably it probably absorbs and then freezes? Well, right, but you know yeah, yeah, how much? The same mm-hmm. amount. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe you have some some freeze easier than others. Less solubility. Yeah. Yeah. Very fascinating. Mm-hmm. Those other mm-hmm. mystery. And it was actually yeah. So this is kind of demonstrating the process is that the more soluble particles, they or elements, they they go into the rainwater and drop out quicker than the ones that are soluble. Right. And then you just have all the particulates mixed in as well, which is... Well, these are actually oh, particulates, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they come out of the magma as gas, but they can only stay as gas when they're as hot as the magma. So as soon as that, uh, uh, they're not at the magma temperature, then they, uh, they become particles. Uh, so, well, yeah, this graph is actually quite nice. Well, this result is quite nice. Uh, so there was a previous study in 2002 to 2005 by um, a researcher called Elizabeth Tam. Um, they they also collected samples in Kona area, Ocean View, and Pahala, uh, and analyzed some of the metals that we are analyzing for. And their data is shown by those like white bars. So light, you know, the white bar with the <clears throat> light uh, blue bar is Kona. And, white bar with the green line is Ocean Pahala. So you can see that in 2002, 2005, like almost all of those sediments are lower than 2018. Right. And of course the emissions were about at least 100 times lower, if not more, and they were coming from poor. Um, Except for lead, huh? Yeah, so part of the particle um, is pointing out, this is because there isn't that much lead that comes out of volcanoes. Most of the lead in our environment, in our air, comes from fuel. 
and there is a there is a steady decrease in how clean the fuel or sorry there's an increase in in the cleanliness of the fuel decrease in the pollution hmm. so it's nice to see that in spite of the eruption and although eruption maybe didn't produce as much as humans do but still it produced something but there you can see that some sources of pollution can be controlled and uh, if we know a volcano is polluting some things we, we could reduce the things we can reduce to protect ourselves awesome also i guess uh, what i want to say to there is that concentrations of team are higher but they're not hundred times higher. So there's hundred times more coming out of the volcano, at least, but they're not reaching the populated areas. Uh, and we believe that that sort of self-cleaning process of the plume, with it raining out really heavily, is what's protecting the areas further away. Of course, it doesn't mean that areas close to the volcano are protected. In fact, they might be receiving more stuff. Um, but hopefully, it actually most of it falls out when it goes over the ocean, in which case that's good news. Um, but one of the things we would like to see is, is sample the catchment water of people in the area, like on Opihikau Road or mm -hmm. down in Sea View, uh, to see if if we are seeing higher concentrations of these polluting metals. Right. Interesting to see. Yeah, it's not, not exactly you know what uh, we're studying, but maybe there's someone that could collaborate with you. Sure. This, all, you know, all this, all these metals dissolved in this water we're talking about. So it's fantastic. The plume is self cleaning, and it happens really close to the ocean side. But all that water with the metals dissolved is going somewhere as well. And it's likely going into our groundwater, going towards the springs down the coast, right? Places, mm -hmm. you know, like we keep potentially or all other spiritual springs along the coast. And maybe we can't see this quite yet, I kind of need a groundwater modeler and that kind of research can really collaborate with you on this kind of thing. But it'd be fascinating to see how that it manifests could, yeah. as well. If you could, then you could see like the the, the Copper, nickel, all these deposited up high, yeah. and then you're like, all right, give it a year, and then we'll see it coming out of the springs. Yeah, that'd be yeah. Amazing. And and measure yeah. soils as well, taking you know, seeing if the top level of the soil has noticeably more pollutants mm -hmm. in it. So that's very important as well because you know, we grow things right. in our soils, and when it gets we just suspended, we might also breathe it in, and mm -hmm. it can settle in our water again. Things like that. Yeah. Is there any more after this one? Um, I guess. Oh well, I could. I could show. I could go yeah. on forever. But uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Are we doing for questions? Yeah. 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 So we can... How does the how does that affect the water table? Do the metals absorb into the soil and leach into the water table? Oh, that's exactly. Well, that's exactly. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> well, very good question. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We'll, we'll have to kind of monitor that, right? And in some way, the people who are, are choosing to remain are you know are resilient enough or have the right. Constitution to live in this kind of aftermath of disruption in this area will kind of our volunteers mm -hmm. to tell us, you know, what's happening with themselves, their own human bodies, with the soil around them, with the places they go and frequent, whether it's by the ocean or mm -hmm. elsewhere, right? So mm -hmm. that's a lot of our audience, which is interesting, right? So for all of you guys who are, you know, watch, watching this, any information you can um, at some point. Um, collect for us would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah and uh, if there are any people who do live in that area, uh, sort of, I guess, directly south is probably a fish rate. Well, right. Opihikau and yeah. Sea View, if you would like us to uh, take a sample of your catchment water, um, please let me know. I guess in the yeah, next few days. Yeah, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be, be here awesome. for a few days. Uh, we can pop by, you know, take only a moment. It will be very interesting to see. Right, try and get some samples collected. Uh, from the community to take mm -hmm. back with you. That's yeah, yeah. And, you know, doesn't, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think, I'm like pretty sure I never emptied mm -hmm. like the whole thing. I left like half of it. Yeah. Like, just mm -hmm. had to balance the pH and it was nuclear at the beginning. Like, it yeah. was not having anything of baking soda trying to balance it out. Mm -hmm. it's too, uh, yeah, I guess, too yeah. And one other thing that we uh, saw, and it's one of my kind of extra slides at the end, so I don't know if we can pull it up, but. Um, is that uh, actually some of those pollutants in the volcanic plume behave much more like pollutants in human emissions rather than other natural sources like desert storms. So in terms of, um, actually... uh, I think we might have to go out of the presentation mode and if you scroll down, uh, let me see. Maybe blow it up. Blow it up. Yeah, so the one with the like vertical graphs, uh, that's it. Yeah. So, um, so what this graph shows is solubility 
which as we mentioned briefly earlier, that's actually important because living things take up things that are soluble much more easily than stuff that is, isn't soluble. So if you look at the little gray bars, that's how soluble desert dust is, which is believed to be the most important natural source of air pollution. Um, and even though it contains really high concentrations, actually very little of it is soluble, and that's why the graphs, the bars, are, the gray bars are quite small. It's only about twenty percent or ten percent is soluble if you put it in a glass of water. Hmm. Um, in in contrast, there are blue bars there. That's urban PM means particle matter. So that's like if you go to a big city and you you collect the water in the air, yeah. which comes probably. From cars, from industry, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. anything that happens in the city, even tarmac being like torn up by tires, oh, yeah, things yeah. like that. And then there's another one which is also heavy fuel combustion, which of course is like power plants being burning. Um, um, so that's like a coal plant or something like that. Uh, like no, it's more like oil, okay. oil okay. yeah, like diesel plant. Or yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, right. I think that's what they measured. So you can see in comparison, the blue bars are way higher than the grey bars, meaning that because of uh, how like human-made pollution is made through combustion, right? When that makes it also much more water soluble and much more available to uh, humans and other living things. And if you look at the red bars in comparison, that's what came out of the volcano last year. And uh, some of them are like a lot. Well, some of them are quite small and more similar, like to the dust. So iron and manganese on the left. Kind of like halfway between, almost yeah. And the iron. Like. Yeah. So it's more, they're more like, not, yeah, yeah exactly. Well, manganese tall. in particular is a good one example there that that's much more similar to dust. Right. Well, but the guys like zinc, copper, and cadmium, the red bars are as high as the blue bars. Right. So even though we think of volcanoes like a natural source of pollution, because of uh, how they make the pollution, it yeah. means that they actually have much more in common with anthropogenic which means human-made emissions. That's really interesting. Mm. That you do have a model, but it's not the model you think you'd find for, like, hey, it's, a, it's actually the closest thing is us, um, yeah. our combustion. Yeah. Just That's, fascinating. Because yeah. that, you know, we, you know our, our economy is really good as far as renewable energy, but we're not completely there, right? And we do also burn diesel. So we do have diesel combustion on this island. Right. Right? That, you know, in comparison with your emissions that we're also concerned about from the Oyster Zone, we maybe you know, can pay attention to that as well, right? You know, um, I think it definitely has to be taken into account uh, of how, you know, what our total emissions are. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, it's something we can't control the volcano. We're not yet. <laughs> One day. Uh, uh, but we, but on the other hand, if we want to protect, especially more vulnerable people, children or people who are ill or whatever, um, then we can reduce the sources we can control, like what kind of fuel we burn or or fireworks, or bonfires, and things like that, just, uh, we, we might have to think about it, as much as we love all our fireworks, but they are just really polluting. Yeah, maybe we don't have to have every single person, uh, right? <laughs> exactly, and we have the same thing in Iceland, and when I was analyzing the data from the eruption, in like 200 mile di distance from the volcano, and I saw some days before the eruption that was so high in pollution. I was like, how is it possible they like exceeded anything that we saw during the eruption? I was like, well, maybe, you know, what, what is happening? And then I looked at the dates and it was like New Year's Eve, when every right. man and his dog blows up fireworks. Right, right. And that was way higher than the eruption did anything, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. And actually, last night, we, um, oh, we, well, we were hoping to get a sample of a wildfire while we are here, because that's another source of air pollution. Mm -hmm. Um, and but of course you can't produce, you know, you can't you can't make them happen. Sort of wild Not fire for an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'll ever be allowed back to Hawaii yeah. if I do that. But I mean, but it's actually we, we we could simulate that. We made a bonfire in our backyard with with local dead wood, and uh, and we, we sampled for a while. And the the like the gunk on the filter in our sampler. That was way dirtier than I've ever seen for a volcanic sample. So. Well, it was supposed to like standing right next to it. So it's it's things in our uh, yeah we we'll, we'll perceive volcanoes as naturally dangerous and polluting, um, but there are actually things we expose ourselves to which are can also be very very polluting. So, yeah. Were you guys around to measure 
in July this year? Uh, well, we would have loved to, but we were just overwhelmed with everything else we were trying to sample. So maybe we, we just, year, uh, yeah, exactly. Change. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. Uh, right, I'd love to come can. back next year again. <laughs> you, you can skip the whole year thing, come back on a uh, New Year's Eve. It goes again. Yeah, uh, is, yeah. It, is it, it runs, as bad as runs twice as, Yeah, it runs twice okay. a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so let's transition a little bit from the yeah. 2018 eruption to the post-2018 eruption. Like, what's happened now? So we've seen some of the eruption videos, but now we have well, on a steamy day, on an overcast day like this, where it's kind of cool, kind of two points, a uh, reasonable point where it's, you can see the steam. This is kind of what it looks like now. In the lower east rift, this is Fisher 8 that we're looking at here. The vents behind Fisher 8, we're looking down rift. Uh, for, you can see Fisher 22's little weird cone there, or it's a Strombolian cone, super tall. Um, but yeah, the gas post eruption now, and we can see how the close proximity of homes to these you know vents that are still outputting. I mean, if you're in Leilani near these things, you still smell something. Uh, so what is, like, let's start off with what do people smell? What is the, what do you think it is? Yeah, so I've, um, what I, I could identify with my own nose was mostly, I would say, organic. That's what it's not like, like kind of cooking, rotting vegetation. For me, that was uh, the most overpowering smell. I myself did not smell anything that smells like sulfur, but there's, I understand there, are, there, there have been multiple reports of smelling H2S, right. which is hydrogen sulfide, so more like a rotten egg sort of smell rather than a kind of acrid uh, sulfur dioxide. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. 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 And um, the biomass is definitely there as well, like the, the, the stink from it uh, going out. Yeah, so uh, for me, that, that was the only thing I could smell when, when I visited. So I, I have been to Fisher 9, and I, yeah, I don't think I've, well, I kind of just passed the other fissures, but yeah. Uh, this is Alayli, right? Right. Like, right? Yeah. So we uh, have some uh, things to ask about all the aliens uh, in particular. So I'm going to roll this little video, and we're going to talk over it. I'm going to pause at little points. So this is at the end of all the Ely. Now, the thing that's interesting here is this wasn't steaming four months ago. Not this area. Not right here. This right here has moved up rift a little bit. It's going to fast forward just a touch. You can see all of this steam coming out. Now, if you look at this video, you're going to have to pay attention to the mouse cursor, but, you know, the steam was, so if we're looking down the rift, where the mouse cursor is, we're looking towards uh, Fisher 8, which is going to be on like the far left there. You can see like the little edge of it. And then you can see uh, coming back up the rift towards Highway 130, how the steam, you can still see it in the in Leilani and Highway 130 coming up Le, uh, further Malka towards all the Ely. But then it really starts to get A, a lot more pronounced, but B, it's hotter. It's just hotter. Uh, when you take temperatures, you well, some of the hottest temperatures we found are right in this area that we're looking at right in here. And this is where the steam was. It did end. And then after the eruption ended, it just began doing a little tiny little march up. And it kept marching up, kept marching up, and it just places that were alive and didn't have the heat would slowly die off the vegetation, and then you start to see the steam open up more and more and more. And now it's just you know continuing its path. So I want to ask you like about that phenomena and you know what your interpretation is. Mm. Yeah, so it's very interesting, and I've I've never seen anything like it before um, in my relatively short career, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. It's so easy for scientists still to focus just on eruption and then kind of forget what happens afterwards. So uh, right. it's really cool to be able to see this. Uh, I guess. What I think is happening, and this is just my my kind of guess, is that um, there is still magma underground. It's quite deep because that's not where it came up to the surface. So I'm talking about the LA right now. Um, so I understand something like two miles depth. Um, so it takes time for that heat to just percolate to the surface, heat, heat the ground up as it right. seeps through. And I think that's why we're seeing kind of a delayed reaction 
uh, now, many months later. And it's not it's not that the magma is coming up to the surface; it's just it's losing its heat. It's like uh, you know, you, you put you put a, something hot into an insulating box, and eventually it might might seep through. And uh, and I think that's what we're seeing. Right. And if uh, one other thing is when you get down into the lower rift where the, the eruption happened. There's very obvious chimneys and vents for this uh, gas to come out of. When you get up into the Olive Ely area, the surface cracks become much, much smaller and then start to just disappear entirely. And then it's more a bit much more dispersed. Like the, mm-hmm. the area of where the heat is, if you're in Leilani and there's heavy cracks, probably like one or two places that it's coming out of. And it's, it's just coming out of there. Up here, it's coming out of a very wide area because it's just so distributed on its way up. When, it, when it's pathing up, there's no clear, straight uh, vertical for it. And I guess the cracks were already there in the landing that the gas is coming out of. So the gas follows the path that's easiest, right. which is through a crack rather than breaking its way through the soil and the ground. Right. So if the cracks were already there, and I've seen on Alley Heli roads that where there are pre-existing lava tree molds from previous eruptions, they just, they're just just like chimneys. And those were the very first things that I would start when I was doing surveys of Hollywood, and I was at the edge of the steam when it was still back away. So we're talking like when the steam was still in this area, I was surveying it, and there was one little spot where there was a tree, and it wasn't even steaming that day, but you could tell that there was heat, and it was measuring at like 170 or something. And you could tell like 170 degrees Fahrenheit. You're like, okay, this is a uh, this is going to become a thing. And I was saying that when the first survey that I did there, I was like, all right, the most likely case is the steam continues to march up rift uh, as it did in 1955, according to the McDonald reports. Mm-hmm. It's like it seems like it, it's doing the same thing. To me, I was just explaining that it doesn't seem like you would need any change in the magma. Like, magma could be a constant at that point, and all these changes still can happen. It's not necessary, it's not required to have a change in the magma for this to take place and be explainable. Absolutely, and you, you can, we can think of so many everyday examples. You boil a kettle, right? You know, you switch off the gas, but the kettle continues to be hot for some time and slowly loses heat. Car engine, same thing, you switch the engine off, it still continues to be hot for some time and cool off gradually. It's not a you know it's not an on-off thing. It's it's right. a it needs time to cool off basically, and that can take some decades in some cases. Right. I think it's fascinating what you said earlier when we were talking about the, the precipitation out of the East Rift Zone. Right. You, we mentioned how it, there was actually water coming out of the magma itself, and that's being precipitated. So um, just kind of clarify for for our viewers, right? The water coming out of the ground now. Do we believe that's actually from the magma itself, or is it actually recirculated groundwater, um, which might take some time to percolate down to those greater depths in this area anyways? Yeah. I, I, based on the relatively low temperatures, so they're at boiling temperature of water or just below, they're not magmatic temperatures at all. Um, and the, kind of the smell, the lack of sulfur dioxide mm-hmm. smell, I think this is... Um, Groundwater or, or the water that's the, is being boiled off the vegetation. Right. Uh, but so what we have done in the, over the last week, we've taken samples of the steam on, on all properties on Ala Ili, so we can make sure that we can we can basically all the trace elements are very good at telling us where they came from. Uh, so if the, if there is any magmatic signal, we should be able to see it in the trace elements. We're hoping we'll just find almost pure steam with some organics in it. That's the work um, on Yeah, so. that's, uh, that would be uh, that would co- um, confirm our guess that yeah. it's so just groundwater and uh, vegetation. That makes sense. Yeah, because mm-hmm. if we combine right the easier path up, right the shallower depth to the actual magma that remains, right, then it makes perfect sense that it takes longer right. for it to manifest up the rift, and you might even cool enough down the rift where it actually looks like it's shifting. Or it's really kind of growing. They're they're going through some process on slightly different timelines. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So Just pulling the map up, um, just showing the steaming areas that we we're talking about. And you can see here I had marked previously where the steaming area was in February, and now it's you know a little bit further. Uh, Say the march of the steam is about like that, which would be about oh uh, half a mile, about half a mile worth of just its progression since it started to work its way up rift from 
kind of near 130, but like uh, at the beginning of the first houses of all Ely, and then it kind of progressed over time. It's been worse and worse than that. Uh, the, there's some really interesting things going on there, but it's most, you know, expected at this point. It's the thing about it. Uh, one of the, the real big dynamic to me is how hot the steam is, and it's been hot the whole time. It hasn't really changed. Uh, temperatures we first bowled in, what was it, November, September or something at, at uh, Highway 130. They're about 10 degrees from the last time I was there. It mm-hmm. hasn't changed yep. like, enough, and it's been pretty much constant for months. And there's places in Leilani Estates where it's much cooler, the steam. It's, it's much cooler, like 150 degrees Fahrenheit as opposed to 200. Um, and then there's areas where it's, 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 it's interesting to me because you can see, like, based on, like, the dew point and the conditions, the weather conditions out, you can see, like, exactly the temperature that you can start to see the steam. You're like, okay, today it's, like, 130. If it's, like, at 135, I can start to see it. And then at 140, oh, yeah, you can see it completely. It completely. Mm-hmm. And then you go and measure parts, like, 120, and you're like, oh, yeah, you can't even see anything. You put your hand over and you can feel that, that steam heat on it, but... Just really interesting how like people be like, oh, it's really steamy today. It's like, yeah, that's just the weather. That's, yeah, that's the weather. Even even during eruptions, when you think you know the volcano is so powerful, we would ignore the weather. It doesn't. The plume looks completely different on dry days when it's it's sort of almost transparent, um, and when it's really humid and at at condensation point, it is much more like a uh, just a weather cloud. Um, hmm. So um, yeah. Definitely. And it's the, the steam has been an ongoing concern for many residents. It just the, the impacts upon them. Uh, we've seen anecdotes about people that are seemingly overly sensitive or sensitive to the H2S or whatever gas that may be present that they cannot handle it. They, they, they just do not, they cannot be there. And it's, it would be interesting when the health studies continue to develop like if can say more about those types of things, but right now, really can't say much. I mean, you no. acknowledge them, and there's to me, I'm like I've heard enough of them from enough people in the area and all reliable areas that I like. There's something up, but I don't know what. Um, yeah, and I think that's a perfectly valid concern. The fact that we don't have guidelines doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe. It's just we don't know. Right. So if people do you feel affected? That is a perfectly valid concern. Right. And um, uh, I think probably on average, children and people who already are suffering from something will probably more likely to feel it. Gen- well, I mean, adults just generally tend to be healthier and more resilient. But, you know, we know so little that we, we just have no idea. And maybe it's just the long-term exposure of many years or, or even just one year that, that could be causing people to almost develop allergy to it. We, we just don't know. I, I, it's not inconceivable. We got one person that says they have a sample for you from a catchment that has not been disturbed. Perfect. Where where is this approximately? Oh, Ely. So Picao. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know how it's best to get in touch. But I guess you could. We'll have um, to mess um, with yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Stuff. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, let's see what else we got. Pet. If someone near Kahana would like to have their catchment tank sampled, who would they? Be? Who, how should they make them? Uh, send us a message uh, or post it as a comment in here. Um, get you in contact in the next few days. That's kind of what it's going to be is just getting all of these samples handled before uh, she takes off. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'll be staying on holiday for a couple of weeks afterwards. And we'll be in Seaview for, for part of it, my husband and I. So if I can convince him to come and do some sampling with me, then, yeah, then we'll, I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, great holiday. <laughs> no, but it's really interesting for for um, for us to do this uh, holiday or not. And um, just people saying they didn't realize the steam had really gotten that far from the the last eruption site, and you can see like the steaming area from the lap from lava. Where it's actually steaming now, oh, it actually takes the point. What is that two and a half or two and a quarter miles, basically, mm-hmm. of 
this isn't eruption. This isn't the eruption area, but it is a steaming cracked area with a bunch of fractures, road damage, a uh, bunch of heat. It, it's incredible to me how the heat really got under the vegetation. So, like, the first thing to go was trees. Like, tall trees, the root systems would just die and then they'd fall over. So, when, when you look at the video from the... Pull it up. You look at this sequence, skip ahead a little bit, just look at the trees that are down. Like, just already. This isn't that old. Like, well, I mean, we wouldn't last very long, would we? If we no. We put it with our feet in there. So, yeah, but grass, or a smaller, the smaller the plant, basically, the more resilient it tends to be. So one of the residents was telling us that this is the kind of the heat migrates ever so slightly. And you can see the grass coming back quite fast and then dying off again and coming mm. back again. So it just takes a tiny shift and then, then it comes back. But I must say for me, it was incredible to see how actually, how well some areas have recovered, like down in Isakale, Pohoiki area. Oh, right. We were there last year, uh, you know, during that horrible episode with all the lays coming over us. Um, and everything looked completely wow. there to me. I thought the vegetation would never come back, especially trees. And then I was there last week and it was just, perfectly green and lush and that's how you imagine how I should be so it's the resilience I think is that what um, has really struck me the most about this this whole thing right I was going to pull up a little video of Apoiki yeah it's, it's fascinating like in the context of having watched that video mm -hmm. right I mean in some areas wow very different yeah you can see how vibrant it is oh, this is beautiful isn't it You can see all the sand that's been washed in. Uh, that'll be what we, the second podcast that we, or uh, live stream we end up doing today will be about this beach and this boat ramp and specifically what the plans are next. You can see all of this accumulation after the eruption uh, ended. It is strange, like as the eruption ended, the sand started to come in. It wasn't really in before. No, all and everyone, after. you know, was watching the lava advancing on the, on the boat ramp. And kind of thinking that it, you know, if it's if the lava spares it, it's safe. And then just a few days later, this sand appears yeah. out of it's nowhere. Like, what? And it's like, yeah, yeah. there's sand. And yeah. It's like, okay, stop. Like, yeah, okay. the eruption was like, I'm gonna get you, boat ramp. You know, I didn't give uh -huh. you the lava, but it just seemed such bad luck. It was so um, much of that sand there. It's incredible. Like just the scale of how much sand that is there, and you can see that it just been deposited in little waves over time. Mm -hmm. You can also see how around on the north side uh, by the lava flow how that's mostly rock. That's all just right. mostly rock in there. There is there used to be a decent amount of sand in there but not now. Interesting it's still shifting. Oh it's still shifting. Um, I mean it's and this is one of those issues where it's kind of hard for for us as humans to really see the whole cycle of these these, yeah. these effects right because we know we've had big eruptions in the long term so in the past of massive amounts of pushing. We've seen historic photographs of these, many of these some areas with a lot of sand in them, a lot less than we see today. So we've kind of gone through a peak of a lot of sand accumulating and then getting dispersed from there. And now we've kind of see accumulating again, right? And mm -hmm. um, this this particular uh, image that we have on screen, you know, the sequence of how the sand piles on the beach is, is interesting because if we all remember, it was not long after eruption ended, the first hurricane came in and and Whatever we may say about what happened on land, the swell certainly pushed a lot of sand on there and made a, a very distinctive berm you can identify today. And then, then there was a second storm, one, and actually that right. one is visible today as well, above the current um, high surf mark, um, berm, which is down here. This so is fascinating for kind of general sedimentology, right? But you know, kind of uh, the, the the cycle is that these places go right. Pohuiki is you know is is an area that's that's a little depression. It's like a little ge geologically small grub and sinks and kind of settles over time, right? So you can imagine that this pattern must repeat over the centuries again and again and again. The same thing is true at Kaimu Bay, right? You know, it kind of gets filled whether by sand or by lava. It settles back in, you know, the sand washes away because eruptions don't come that frequently compared to the redistribution of the sand from the ocean and so it's, it, we're really getting a fascinating glimpse into all these processes within this last year right and it's kind of more, more to come still mm, right. and you appreciate how fast things can change as well 
you think kind of na- you know ge- geology is such a slow process, mountain building, mountain t- being torn down, but not in volcanic areas. That's just like right. as fast as you know. Especially on yeah. Kilauea, where it's just yeah. like it, it had two speed for like we're now finding out about another speed where it's like oh it has an off switch for a little while. Like that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Like it can actually not be going off all the time, huh? But uh, it, like for the past thirty five years, it has two modes on and really on. Like. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That's a very good way of putting it. Uh, it, it, it didn't vary. So it's just insane. Like the the to now be in this this calm where it's like wow, we get Kilauea at green normal. We get to see what is background levels mm-hmm. for everything from seismic to tilt to like oh, air to quality. Like air quality. Yeah. Like we we didn't have a control really on these types of things. No. Now it's like okay, this is what control looks like. You know, like, and that's why we're here back again a year later is to collect yeah samples in the same places same methodology but that will tell us what is in the background uh how much did the volcano contribute on what fuel you know, yeah, wildfires even sea spray how much does that actually account for mm. and yeah and what is the difference well very cool That's um fantastic you guys have been get, get working with the usgs quite a lot right and so i mean we'd be curious um i know where you got you're not Actually, USGS, but you know, um, there are some questions that have been circulating, Dane, um, about uh, USGS numbers. Right. Um, Just about um, H2S, what has been detectable before and during the eruption and now afterwards the eruption, um, sulfur, di- and, uh, yeah, SO2, was, it, it has been detected since. We've heard it's below detectable limits, but what are those detectable limits types of ideas like of course, for to help yeah. clear things up for people? Yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, gas measurements are still ongoing at the summit, and occasionally they they have tried to measure gases from near Po or, or on the Opihikal Road to see if anything is still coming from the fissures. So um, from from the fissures in Leilani and Po is like zero SO2. Uh, which is to be expected because right. that's a magmatic gas eruption gas. Right. Uh, from from the summit, there is compared to what it was before. For example, in two thousand eight, it was something like five thousand tons a day when the lava lake opened up, and then since then, I think it's been like one thousand tons, two thousand tons. Now it's been like thirty thousand. Sorry, um, thirty tons, which is how many <laughs> how many zeros is that? So, yeah, it's mm-hmm. like it's like one percent basically. Uh, uh, and it maybe is, has crept up slightly to 50, 70 tons. But right. uh, from a caldera that size, you, all, you know, you have so many little fumaroles that it just adds up. It doesn't mean there is like a central vent that's gearing up to open up as a lava lake or something like that again. Right. We're not seeing that, I don't think. Uh, it's just kind of, you just have t- loads of these tiny fumaroles right. in all of them emitting a small amount, but adding up. It's just right. such a big caldera now. You, know, you, you, yeah. can, you can kind of, if you're up at the park, you can identify these with just a pair of binoculars because you can get the discolorations on the, in the, where it has collapsed, the new exposed area. It's like, oh, wow, new discolorations. You can just mm-hmm. see them with the naked eye. Like, that's yeah. pretty cool. Like, yeah. And we took a sample there as well. Um, so to see if there are any of these trace metals coming up that could tell us something about where, how deep the magma is or what, yeah, where it could be coming from. Uh, yeah, there is a... There is ongoing monitoring, basically, of course, because we know Kilia is not dead. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So those were those were SO two numbers. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything you can say about the CO two? Uh, CO two, uh, not not from the summit. I, hmm. I I don't know enough about that. I'm afraid. Um, we know that they're measuring it, and we do know there are challenges because of what Dean mentioned. Like you know, yeah. the fact we don't have one big chimney by the lava like anymore makes yeah. it more challenging. That's the thing, and you, as everyone knows, there's so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere anyway that CO2 is always tricky because you know there's so many variations. Mm-hmm. Although we say, okay, the the atmosphere is now at 400 ppm of CO2, but if probably in this room now we probably well the windows are open, so we're probably fine. But if you would close all doors and windows, like within an hour, you would be in the thousands of ppm of CO2. Uh, it's just what we can breathe out. Yeah. Uh, so it's there's so many, and you know, you stand next to a road, you might get CO two from the traffic. So it's knowing like what's just normal fluctuation, what's from the volcano when the emissions are so diffuse and so 
whole social life there is really tricky. So I think that's why it just keeps being kind of maybe elevated, maybe not, but nothing like really spectacularly nothing elevated. Spiking, like, like not as spiking, far as I know. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. All right. Um, let me see if we got any other questions. If anybody's got any questions, feel free to just drop them in the chat and we'll address them real quick. Um, let's see. Just on that. Oh, so uh, USGS during the eruption, we were hearing like about uh, 50,000 tons per day of sulfur dioxide released uh, from Kilauea. But now that's getting readdressed and it's kind of going uh, doubling. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to explain that, like the reason what is. happened yeah. and like why that revision is coming now? Yeah. So essentially, um, well, gas measurements of SO2 have really become a proper thing you know, that volcano observers can use quite reliably, maybe in the last 10 years or less. Or, um, so, and, and in that time, we've not really had to deal with as huge emitters as, as the low east rift zone eruption or the one in Iceland four years ago. Um, so it's just the technology wasn't really capable of dealing with it. There was, so the way this instrument works is that it looks at, it's almost like a camera, a normal camera, where it takes in light you know, from the sun, from, the, from just our ambient sky, and it sees how much of that light is being blocked out by the gas. But if there's too much gas, then it's just like, it can't see anything and it can't tell you how much gas there is. Uh, it's just like... Uh, you know, if you shine too much light into your camera, it will also become saturated. Right. And uh, and this is why we've uh, scientists have, of course, experts in this um, kind of atmospheric physics, almost the not even volcanology of atmospheric physics. They've had to develop new algorithms, new computer codes to try to work out. Luckily, we do have the measurements. We just can't like didn't have the code to extract the information out of those measurements. And um, what my colleagues tell me is, who are used to running these kind of really uh, elaborate codes is that you need a supercomputer to run for a week, maybe, to extract that. So that's wow, why we're just, we're just still learning, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, it's just a huge amount of processing data. Um, so our, like, our laptops wouldn't, you know, yeah. wouldn't cope with this. It would take, like, I don't know how long, Will, you're the computer yeah, expert. Like, how long would that take to run? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it would never. Your computer would die first. <laughs> like, yeah. computer for the rest of its life, failed, basically. Like, yeah. Point. So that's why that's why we're now we're just we're just kind of learning about how to deal with such large emitters, and uh, and it might you know for all we know it might even go above the hundred thousand tons a day once the supercomputers stop running. <laughs> basically, oh, yeah. you know, once we we we, can, we say that, okay, this is what we think is the closest. There's still so, yeah. so much to be done with. Once the data is, you know, having the data is one thing, having it in a format that can be imported into something like a training data set for machine learning algorithm, that's something completely different. It just doesn't automatically get packaged in that type of format. Mm -hmm. um, once it, once all the back data, the backlogs of data get put into that type of format and you can start using it on training data, oh, then the, the things like data mining would give you would just be huge. But yeah. Like, from what I understand, not close to that yet, that type of thing. It's still emerging in, you know, data science and, you know, information, uh, statistics, statistics, data mining, all that is still emerging. And for this purposes, we've got a long way to go, but we're just, it's so exciting for, like, what that will be able to sell, the correlations that you wouldn't even expect to think that were possible. Yeah. Like, yeah. So it's a, it's a great training also for future eruptions because now we've seen really big ones so we could actually probably handle the smaller ones much better and also right. if if the eruption is to happen in, in the future we'll know like what what it can be right mm -hmm. you, you you'd be better able to gauge like hey this has the potential to be a bigger one than one of those little smaller ones yeah right? i think this one just yeah. whatever we need to base that off of as understanding develops and, you know there's a statements can be made mm -hmm. and then you have the algorithms ready yeah, yeah exactly yeah so um you know we yeah as long as we can learn from the disasters that happen we can't prevent them from happening well we can't prevent natural events from happening right uh but we can't prevent them from have becoming disasters i think that's what we should be aiming for even though we're not there yet but that's what we have to work with as scientists with the communities with the decision makers with whoever you know just with with communicators in fact and those yeah. those like four or five key agents have to gel really in order for anything to work 
think that's a yeah. bit of a big learning curve as well for you guys. Um, right. Um, you can have uh, one agency be an all-star, but if they're placed behind another agency, which is far from an all-star, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter how good you are at that. Bureaucracy decides to clamp down its fists on you. Well, sucks to be in that position. Yeah. Um, and we've seen tragic examples like uh, in Italy, there was a big earthquake in 2011, and scientists got put into, well, got trials and some put in prison for not predicting the earthquake, essentially. Um, and, and those kind of things are not, um, not encouraging scientists to then right. make their opinions known. Uh, so it's we have to be yeah very understanding of kind of our limitations but and forgiving and but but try to work together I think is the is the is the key. Definitely. Let's check to see if there's any questions. Mm. I'm about out. <laughs> um, we didn't really talk about H two S. I think not measurement wise. Is that something you want to? Yeah, I was just wondering if you did have some numbers for that. Well, um, so I guess. Um, yeah, so there isn't ongoing HS monitoring in right. the area, and I think that was something that people wanted to see done. But you, you, I think you brought up that um, there may be future increase from the geothermal power plant, which is not right. right. It's, yeah. That's the thing is, right now we have we've operated for 20, 30 years or since the sixties, whatever. With the idea that. Puna Geothermal Venture is the only ones that produce H2S in Leilani or in, the, in Lower Puna. Now there's, you know, we know that there is naturally occurring alongside it, but those numbers aren't released uh, for either of them. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, so we just don't know twice. So now good luck, you know, trying to say it's not PGV causing that smell. Mm -hmm. Like, you, yeah, I could say like, yeah, that smell predated it, but I can't prove that. I don't have any data because I'm not getting the, the people yeah. that are pulling those numbers. It's like, just drop the numbers. Yeah. You know, they're not going to scare people that much. Um, we've just been through this. So just, mm -hmm. you know, let people know some of that type of stuff. Because then it just, I hear numbers from residents via second hand. And I'm like, okay, are these numbers that actually, they remember them precisely and the months and the days that those numbers were told to them and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It's like, why don't just the numbers out there in a spreadsheet or something so it's, mm -hmm. you know, data scientists can pull this stuff and actually research it and then when PGD turns on it's like hey we already knew what the baseline was for naturally occurring post 2018 eruption before PGD turned on you don't do that before it turns on it's like okay well we, we can go ask them to shut off for a week yeah you know we should have done this in the year that we had prior basically mm -hmm. to establish this type of thing but I'm just I feel like it's going it's an it's an easy opportunity. It's an easy one. Just put out some numbers and just have it for later. Mm, no, I completely so understand that concern. And it might be that those concentrations are absolutely perfectly fine because our noses are extremely sensitive to right. HS, so we smell such tiny concentrations that actually most instruments wouldn't even pick it up. Right. And, and um and for instance, in Iceland where I'm from, there's uh, all hot water just stinks of HS. Uh, so and. And everyone has a hot tub in the backyard with, you know, HDS smelling water. And, you know, as far as we know, there's been absolutely no negative health effects of that. Oh, so, it, yeah. And all our, but, all our power is geothermal, well, all domestic power, 95% or something like that. So that's what I'm saying is it's important to, to have measurements so you can then say, right. look, the levels are so low. And we know from other places that's fine. And, I guess uh, and the smell doesn't mean anything. But if you don't know what the levels yeah. are, so I completely understand that concern. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I guess it's it's just getting somebody to do it, right? It's that seems to be a tricky part. So right. ideally, you would have an air quality station somewhere where you know somewhere in the in the community where that can measure HLS. Right. Even yeah. like a light monitor station would be great, but I'm like, you guys have you guys the USGS has taken measurements in the Lower East Rift and yeah. several sites. They have that data. This release that yeah. set. Like, so that's the thing the is about thing is to me yeah. is. It, even if you have to say, like, oh, it's below detectable limits, okay, then what are detectable limits? Sure. Like, just, it, it's, it would be not too hard to phrase this thing to me, okay. to, to be able to release that. But every time I try and talk to somebody about it, it's just like, oh, it's so low, don't worry about it. Like, mm -hmm. that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't work in this kind of data world mm -hmm. that we live in now. It's, oh, yeah, trust me. Yeah. I get it, you're a professional. 
you should have access to this data then just drop it you know mm -hmm. just just drop it for me yeah well as you know i'm not um right. you know i don't work yeah. Yeah, yeah but what i do know is that the instruments that hbo and other volcano observatories and, and scientists use is uh geared for measuring really high concentrations so actually detection limits are quite high so it's half the ppm of h2s and that's what hbo uses as well the 0.5 is the, 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 the 0.5. so the that's minimum. way awesome. above like what you would smell and way above right. um even what is recommended to be the one hour exposure limits so yeah it's um i don't think that's any secret that that's the, the detection limit so uh but but basically yeah HBO, because it's their volcano observatory, they, their job is to monitor the volcano, not air quality from it, if that makes sense. Because um, they, their job is to predict if the volcano is going to do something, not the kind of what happens after the eruption or what happens in very far away from, from the volcano. Uh, because there are, there are, so that's more um, EPA and Department of Health responsibilities, really. Right. Because it's environmental hazard rather than uh, more like a lava flow or, or emission. My thing is, is like when I was looking, like I'm not a geochemist yeah. at all, but I was looking at H2S and I was just like, okay, I don't trust myself to be able to hold these numbers. And judging by what, my experience of the county, I don't really trust them to pull these numbers. Even the Department of Health SO2 monitors, they went haywire a few times and just started screaming out numbers that were ridiculous. Sure. So it's like, you guys already have the professionals. Or you have the geochemists and all the team. They've already gone and pulled the numbers. It's just the last step of telling the numbers mm -hmm. to the public. Is that's the part that I, I and I just I don't I really have a I, don't, I can't understand that because it's we share SO two numbers so readily. Yeah. And then H two S is like a secret. Like oh do you? And it's like just talking to you. It's like I've found out more about the H2S than I have in many conversations elsewhere, mm -hmm. trying and trying to get answers out of it. And it's just like, I, yeah, I give up at times because it's like, okay, I'm not getting through any, any of this isn't it working, mm -hmm. you know? Well, I can't, you know, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. All I can say is everything I know is that the concentrations are low, which is not what you want to hear, but they are low. Um, and hopefully they are below levels that we know is to be harmful even though we may not understand understand very well long-term impacts of H2S, you know, in right. very low concentration, but for people who are, for whatever reason, sensitive. And that's just, that, that's not a secret, it's just that just information doesn't exist anywhere, how much is too much for certain people. Right. I think it's yeah. fascinating you mentioned that, you know, in Iceland, you had been living with more restrictions of H2S. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That is very interesting. Very great. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, but people are still concerned about the power plants there as well. Um, Power plants they are very good at scrubbing things and pumping them, you know, in, in, into the ground in a form that can't be released. So just basically making natural power plants. Yeah, geothermal power plants, exactly, yeah. Um uh so I think they're doing the best they can. But even in Iceland, we you know, we don't have a health study that says like this is how much H2S is too much. Um mm. we just you know that people are generally healthy, don't seem to suffer from you know, your bath smelling like you've just, you know, fallen into a bathtub of rotten eggs. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, from, you know, from my total guesstimates, that seems to be fine. Uh, yeah, that's um, interesting mm -hmm. to hear that. Like, How long has Iceland been geothermal? Probably the 60s. Yeah, like the 60s. Yeah, yeah, not that far back, but, yeah. Um, that's when they started producing um, at least electricity, and then, mm -hmm. and now they're very good at, uh, heating up groundwater with the hot water and so we can have hot water on tap without having to, you know, heat Actually, it up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it still smells, mm. even though it's technically cold water that's heated up with the geothermal mm. water. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. The, I, I know the Iceland, they really made some advances in their geothermal. I mean, they, they, don't they, they have like deep drilling uh, wells where they go like 5,000 meters yeah. or something. Yeah, crazy it's like crazy. That, it's science fiction in some cases. Wow, that's deep. And what's really interesting is that now they are carbon dioxide uh, neutral. So they, uh, what I briefly mentioned is that they can take carbon dioxide and mix it with uh, lava, actually in fact basalt, and cold water, and then it creates a mineral that is perfectly natural, which is calcite, where you get normally in geothermal areas, but it's, um, it can stay in that form for thousands of years. And now they even there's development to go a step further, and not just at least not just make it carbon neutral, but actually carbon 
uh, negative. Oh, wow. So pump out the carbon, excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we now have um, from, well, because of all our human activities emit something and, right. and, and bind it. That's a really cool idea there. Like yeah. That's exciting, you know, developments for a geothermal type of yeah. plant to be able to produce energy and at the same time try and scrub uh, carbon dioxide. Yeah, make our environment cleaner. Yeah. Like yeah. that's, you know, win win right there. Yeah. Um, so watch that space, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's a place that has how many volcanoes in Iceland? Uh, well, roughly uh, thirty. Thirty. Yeah, sort of act what we consider active, active or potentially active. Yeah, and and the geothermal plants exist. Yeah, perfectly fine in that. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the, uh, of course the. Well, I, I don't know what I was going to say. You know, they're 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 not everywhere around the country. So some mm -hmm. some places part of the country have to use uh, fuel as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but we're getting there to being just geothermal, at least for domestic use, and um, if not for industry. Very cool. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think that gets all my questions out of you. I think well, I mean, I'd <laughs> so, like to close and be like, what do you yeah. think was the most important thing that you yeah, heard from all Yeah, this? oh, I mean, so many things. But I think for me, that kind of that self-cleaning of the, the, the plume actually uh, has this ability to reduce its impacts um, because it, it just rains out stuff very, very quickly. So the far field areas probably would have suffered way more based on just how much was being pumped out of the volcano. But the plume has this, it appears, this kind of ability to, to cleanse itself and reduce its impact on the far field areas. Um, and that's that's not something we, we expected, we, we didn't know about. We, nobody else married it before, right? Yeah, so, so we hope that cool. for future eruptions, we can you know use our knowledge and say, look, this is, this is what's going to happen, more or less. That's, that's the types of things that helps with the modeling, you know, going forward. If we're like, hey, we now know these mm -hmm. types of effects take yeah. place. Really interesting uh, information. And anybody that had uh, catchment water from around Leilani, mostly downwind is what she's after. Like, contact me on Tracker or, or uh, uh, she's uh, linked, in, she's tagged in the post so you can message her directly. And in the next few days, we'll try and get some of those samples collected um, for. You know, help understanding about where these minerals and where all these elements and molecules end up going. Like, what happened? How did they fall out? Like, they should be in the tanks, as you were saying. Yeah, now. they, like, they could be in the tanks. Yeah, yeah. We should have them. Hopefully, they're mostly just in the ocean somewhere. Um, but I, I, I suspect some of them end up in the catchment tanks. And if they are, we, we might need to also build that in into the eruption response next time. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I thank appreciate you guys, it, yeah. and uh, hope everybody enjoyed it online. And you know, glad to have you back, Phil. And like for <laughs> tracker audience that's wondering, you know, where are our volcanic updates? We'll get you one pretty soon. It's just yeah. been there for us. There hasn't been much happening. It's been pretty quiet, even with HVO rays and the the Mauna Loa alert level. It was still we were talking about that you could argue it either way to keep it at green or slightly elevated it's how do you want to define what is yellow what is or what is normal what is advisory and it's we don't have a historical record that's really reliable to base anything off of so it's like I, I agree with what they've said with the the why they're placing it at yellow being above background levels it's like cool now we have a definition to work off of here above background levels something to you know you can start to work with um, so I agree, but and they, they, I like how they did it too. They did it like as casually as possible, not to scare people. Like, oh yeah, we'll just don't tell me we'll just slip it into the uh, the monthly update. And you know, like, it was, it was, that's one of the main things. News media is going to blow it up and try and run with it. Like, oh, it's coming, you know. And it, yeah, and then you have people canceling holidays here right. and stuff like that oh, for no reason. Right. Oh, so, uh, because yeah. this little thing went up a little bit. It's mm -hmm. like, well, it's just like. Academically, it makes sense to move it up and you like start making arguments for raising it up, but it's like the consequences of raising it up. So you just, just try and slide this one by. We talked before that, you know, we could have gone either way. We could have yeah. understood them lowering it to green or leaving that yellow the entire time. They both would have been justified. And, you know, it's fine. The way it happened is fine. And, um, we'll go into more detail later. Yep. Just to say, you know, um, very briefly, no one's got anything to worry about Mauna Loa imminently. Address that. All right. Well, thank you again, and uh, we'll keep this going on the comment section below. Great. Right. Yeah, right. absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Hi, everyone. Stay classy. Stay classy, Luna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>